committee to order. Um, entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. So, so moved. Support. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Public comments. Public comment guidelines. Each individual will state their name and have three minutes to address the board. You may only address the board once this once under this public comment opportunity. You may not yield your time to others. Board members will not debate or answer questions at this time. Any public comment? No public comment. Okay. Let's move on to minutes of our last meeting on January 10th. Entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Minutes. Support. Any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Lifeways monthly report. Good afternoon. Um, in your packet, you will have a memo from Mary Beth with some outlines of some items I'm going to address with you today. Um, the first one is our strategic plan update um, regarding better health. We are continuing to plan for integration of a federally qualified health center within our medical services unit. This will occur when our building remodel work is complete. We are also incorporating into its integrated health planning the ability to provide some on-site point testing and the ability to do draw or blood draws for lab work on-site. And a post-hospital diversion work group continues to partner with Henry Ford Allegiance Health to reduce inpatient recidivism. So individuals who are presenting, going on the psychiatric unit, being discharged, and returning back to the psychiatric unit within 30 days. We also have some marketing efforts that are underway to educate the community on crisis diversion services. We currently have a crisis R&R service, and we are planning to continue to fund this critical work with millage dollars for fiscal year 2020. Uh, Mary Beth will be coming in early fall with a proposed use of those millage dollars. We are looking to expand um, to a crisis residential service and um, additional crisis services on site to have a continuum of crisis services um, at once one place, which would be our building versus people having to go to the emergency room, then be transported over to us. Um, we're working with law enforcement on an ability to have a secure drop point for law enforcement to bring individuals that they are concerned about also. Also for section 298, the pilots, um, the pilots, the start date has been moved from October 1st of this year to October 1st of next year. And just uh, for your information, in our 21 county region, um, we had one CMH that had proposed to be part of the 298 pilot, that's Saginaw, and they have since pulled out of the pilot. So there's not a CMH in our region who's looking to partner with the Medicaid health plans for the section 298 pilot. In addition, I have some information that's not included in your packet that we received this morning. Um, the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice is working collaboratively with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and foundations to expand and enhance treatment of substance use disorders with jails across the state. Um, as you are aware, we have had uh, one clinician sitting in the uh, jail here in Jackson with uh, millage dollars supporting that individual to provide on-site mental health services for inmates that were in the jail. Um, when Wayne State came in and provided that presentation for services, um, a huge outlier of need was substance use disorder treatment for individuals in the jail. And so we have been awarded um, an opportunity to facilitate Medicaid assistant treatment in certain jails. And Jackson was suggested and has been um, approached to be able to start doing this. Um, it is looking like about two hundred fifty dollars to $350,000 in the next year to have additional resources for individuals. And technical assistance groups are going to be facilitating a planning process so that implementation can begin on October 1st of 2019. So a pretty quick turnaround. Um, we learned about this today. And one of the reasons Jackson was chosen was our already collaborative work that we're doing with the jails. Um, my understanding is um, the undersheriff will be coming um, to have a conversation about um, their their work and their plan and their desire for this um, but it is forthcoming and it looks like october 1st we would be up and running so we currently are already doing vivitrol so vivitrol is being provided as a, a post-incarceration point um, for individuals who's, who've been identified and they can receive a vivitrol shot at the time of being released um, this is also going to be looking at suboxone and methadone also for additional supports for inmates while they're in the jail any questions, commissioners? 
I have two. One, the uh, um, the facility that you're building there for medical care, okay, <coughs> is that mm -hmm. going to compete with the Center for Family Health? We are actually partnering with Center for Family Health. Center for Family Health now is located co-located in our building, okay. and we have been working with the Center for Family Health to design the medical services area for integrated health. So they will have um, um, primary care on site with us, um, along with our psychiatrists and nurses, and being able to provide integrated health to an individual as they come in. So it's not in competition, it's in concert with. Okay, so not duplication. No, Sorry. because we're not providing primary care now. Okay. Second question is that I forgot where I read it in this long human services agenda. Um, what is LifeWays doing in regards to the suicide rate? Or what are their plans to do anything about the suicide rate? Because it's higher in kids and it's higher going up to age like 28. It's mostly in males, not so much in females. And I haven't read any place. What is there an action plan to deal with that? It is part of our strategic plan. And we also have uh, partnerships and representation at the suicide prevention coalitions in Jackson and Hillsdale County, and then also at the state level to provide insight and guidance on how to maybe best present either whether it's education awareness. We also have trainings. We have an assist training right now. We have safe talk trainings. Um, we do presentations in the school um, to assist educators and the students around suicide prevention and awareness. Okay. Mm -hmm. youth, me youth mental health first aid would be another one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much for a good report. No problem. Oh, wait. Other questions? Mr. Chair. Oh, Tony. Hi. Did I hear you right that you're doing, you're drawing blood now? No, that's part of our plan with the integrated health. So we are working plan with what? I integrated health. So we are working right now with Center for Family Health. They are currently co-located in the back of our building, but there's no integration. Um, the person presents in a separate entrance and comes in. Um, in our building remodel, we are remodeling with the assistance of Center for Family Health at the table, and we are creating an integrated health area where a person can come in if they are seeing our psychiatrist and there's a need or anything addressed. Um, they can they can be walked down to primary care right then. The person can come in. They can get blood draw done right at that lab point in our building. It just won't happen until the remodel occurs. Okay, so, so not Center currently. For Center for Family Health will still remain an independent business. Yes, they, they are just a partner with us. But their own, their own personal staff, their own budget. It is their staff. Yeah, they they have their their uh, primary care doctor, um, nurses um, will be present, and then we will have the ability. And basically, the the thinking is is to really provide a more integrated versus a co-located experience for individuals. So I come in and I'm hypertensive and I'm on a psychotropic medication. I can see the psychiatrist. I can see the primary care doctor all in one fell swoop. Not see the psychiatrist today and be referred down to the back of the building and have an appointment in two days at Center for Family Health. It will be Center for Family Health staff. It will be co-located co in an area with us to integrate behavioral health and, and primary care. Okay. Thank and you. just as a perk, be able to provide blood draw labs as people come in. Any other questions? There is. Yes, you mentioned your strategic plan. Mm -hmm. uh, when is that scheduled to be completed? Uh, we have a current strategic plan, and this month in, I believe it's the 24th or 25th. Four hours. Yeah, we have an afternoon where we meet with our board to work on our, strate our next strategic plan. So our strategic plan is currently in place. Um, and then Already we, in place? Yes, we have one. Yes, always in place. And we have a new one that we're developing with our board um, this month. Okay, I'm sorry. Just to make sure I'm clear. <laughs> You're working on a strategic plan currently? We we have a strategic plan for our agency. Right. We yeah. always do. Right, gotcha. And then we are revising it with our board. We have a, we have a retreat currently this month. Currently writing a strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like for our next fiscal year. Like we had to do. Right. Yeah. right. I just yeah. want to make sure. And I'm that's happening that. this month okay. for those revisions for the next fiscal year. Where does that take place? At LifeWays. At LifeWays. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, and, and then um, lastly, too, the... Mm -hmm. um, but my question that I had, well, the other question that I had was very similar to um, Dr. Tompkins' uh, mm -hmm. question, but so I'll just kind of conclude in saying uh, that suicide uh, awareness and prevention is something that I am very passionate about and would like to uh, be of whatever assistance um, that I can be in, in, in those developments. Would you like me to have somebody reach out to you? Yes, please. Okay. Darius? Yes, sir. You could join LifeWays. I'm trying. <laughs> 
I, I am. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to adjust some things in my schedule so okay. that I can. I can uh, definitely take care of this stuff for you. Uh, join that board. Yep, Thank I you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. Next, we have medical care facility report. No one's here. Okay. Okay, next is the Region 2 Agency on Aging Plan. May I talk to the committee about the plan, area plan? Pardon me? May I talk to the committee about the area plan? Yes, you're on the agenda. The Region 2 Area Agency on Aging Plan is where uh, the, the Region 2 Area Agency on Aging outlines the services they plan to provide and the programs they plan to fund for the coming three years. Uh, and this then uh, goes to each county board of commissioners and then goes to the State Commission on Aging for their final approval. Uh, one th thing I noticed this time is that the Region 2 Area Agency on Aging, which serves Jackson, Lenway, and Hillsdale counties, they keep some of the Older Americans Act money in-house so that they provide services to older adults. And in this plan, it's an increased amount compared to the plan that we're just finishing up. And it's to me, I just wanted to let the commissioners be aware of that, just to, to keep an eye on it. Um, this year, it's over $600,000 they will keep in-house. That's 170000 more than the, the current area plan. So. It, Historically, when I've, I've been around long enough, area agencies on aging were to oversee local service providers such as departments on aging as, as local providers provide services. And over time, area agencies on aging throughout the state are more and more um, keeping some of the Old Americans Act money so that they provide services directly themselves. And these are services separate from the Medicaid funded program, the Medicaid waiver program. So just, again, I just wanted you to be aware of that. Is there duplication? There is not a duplication of service. No. Any other questions, commissioners? Yeah, I had one question. Um, I'm trying to find it. Um, as I was kind of going through um, the document, I came across something that I wasn't very familiar with, and I'm struggling to find it. They did say that they would come in the 23rd as well. Okay. Well, just for the sake of time, I'll hold my, my question until the 23rd. Okay. I, it's, I, I, I didn't write it down, and unfortunately, and I, and I can't find it again. Um, so I'll, I'll be here through the meeting if you happen to think of it. Okay. I'll, Thank you. Okay. Next, let's move to the finance or, prop, or E Finance 219 Health Fund Budget Amendment. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I just have a kind of routine budget amendment for you all. Um, every year I have to do some budget amendments for the health fund. As you can imagine, we have some grant funding changes that happen after the original budget. We need to true up our actual expenses to um, what's actually occurring from a budget perspective. And um, there's some estimates that have changed as well. So we have a budget, a budget amendment here for $55,553. It's a net increase to revenue and expense. And if you have any questions, I will entertain them at this time. Any questions, commissioners? Yeah. What, what are you attributing the uh, wage, basically all, almost all labor cost increases to? Did we uh, hire additional staff? or? No, there's not higher um, staff, but we have so many departments in the health department that sometimes we have to shift some of the staff around if there's a, a decrease in grant funding. So one of the biggest changes we had this year was Medicaid outreach was, was Department 221451, and you'll see a lot of decrease there. So when that decrease happens in that department, we have to increase another department. Okay. Um, so it's, it's not really any 
increase of full-time employees or part-time or anything is just a shifting of where the staff are working okay thank you okay good question Does it? Okay. any other questions we have to move this on to the full board entertain a motion to do so okay any thank questions? you all in favor aye aye, aye thanks Next is F Department on Aging Grant Application Request. Okay, so in the area plan, it talks about uh, grant funding, and the my request is permission for the Department on Aging to apply for grant funding for the coming uh, three years, uh, fiscal year 2020, 21, and 22, which starts October 1st of this year, and the amounts uh, are list, listed in the request for proposals. The amounts listed are by the for the region. So my plan is to apply for uh, the same amount of funds that we're currently receiving in, in this current fiscal year and for the same programs that we currently provide through um, Older Americans Act funding. And there's an attachment that shows a list of those programs. So the current amount we receive through grants from the Area Agency on Aging is $1,127,240. And there is some local match, uh, 15%. And in addition, senior millage funds are, are used to provide uh, the services. So it's part uh, grant funding as well as local funding in order to provide the services. Any questions, commissioners? If not, entertain a motion to move to the full board. Discussion? I have a second on that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item is Senior Citizen of the Year resolutions. And this is something that the Fair Board and the County Board of Commissioners and Department on Aging honor uh, two or more older adults for their volunteer service since turning age 60. And the uh, two people we'd like to honor is Kermit Caps and Ward Wilson. And you have uh, the resolutions, I think, in your packet. Um, Kermit Caps volunteers at the uh, Jackson Area Recovery Community and Home of New Vision. He's done that for six years. And Ward Wilson is a volunteer at, at St. Luke's as well as other work with crop in Brooklyn and Special Olympics. Have to move that to the full board. Let's entertain a motion to move this to the full board. So moved. Second. Any questions, commissioners? Right there. Yeah, right up the top here is the assessment. Yeah. On the top where it says um, uh, type, action, comments, and full board. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It goes Great. to the full board. Thank okay. you. Okay. And that and the award will be given on senior day at the fair. It's uh, Monday of, of the fair at 11 o'clock. And the reason that we send it to the full board is it's a resolution from the Board of County Commissioners other than resolution from the committee. And the, uh, on my monthly staff report, the, uh, the other item that I haven't mentioned yet is that um, there are funding cuts from the uh, Older Americans Act specifically for Meals on Wheels. And that'll affect our budget this year and next year, and we're preparing budget adjustments accordingly, as well as in 2020, the department will be cutting $185,000 from our budget, from our original budget. There any other uh, not that uh, there are no other grants that I'm aware of to apply for. So, who who is cutting the meals on wheels? Um, it's called the national senior incentive program it's funded through usda and it's 
we get so many cents per meal provided and it varies from year to year and the area agency on aging estimated to the best of their ability how much we would receive this year and it's drastically cut from what they expected so it's a formula based based and it's determined by the number of meals provided throughout the state last year so it gets kind of complicated Question, so I have the request, and this was actually my question, so okay. I'm glad I opened that there. The, uh, so has the program, in, or I'm sorry, let me word this correctly, have the number of meals over the course of the year decreased from previous years, which is why the funding is being cut? Yes, especially for uh, nationwide for our co what we call congregate meals, which is uh, lunch or dinner at our different si senior sites. Yeah. Nationwide, those numbers are going down. <laughs> Do they know why? Uh, when Older Americans Act first started and we had congregate nutrition sites, yeah. it was very common for people to go to a site, have lunch, do activities. Now with the newer generation, uh, they're out doing things, which is a good thing. Um, very active and engaged elsewhere, so the attendance at uh, congregate nutrition sites have just steadily been going down. I'm wondering if transportation is an issue. Transportation is a concern, yes, for some for some people who can't make it, uh, can't use a public transit system to get to the site. That can make a difference as well. But we're not seeing as many younger, newer, p new people participating at the sites. We are getting some, but uh, not in the numbers of the people who are are no longer attending due to health or okay. other reasons. Are there other, and my last question, are there any other grants that you could potentially apply for to offset the cost? Uh, not, th not that I am aware of at this point. I mean, we look, but um, there's the Friends of Jackson Seniors is a nonprofit who we work with to apply for uh, grant funding from foundations. And they are looking at applying to a foundation in the near future to help replace a meal delivery van which then helps frees up some money for us to use in in uh, our other nutrition programs okay but what funding f directly for the congregate senior nutrition programs or meals on wheels um i'm not aware of any funding to apply for at this point and then uh, i'm sorry i thought that was my no. last one but your last comment sparked another question there D looking down the road you don't foresee this program the congregate meals program being uh, cut completely do you I don't see the congregate program being cut completely no okay but we do need to look at attendance and the the sites who have the uh, better attendance to support those and those that have maybe five or fewer people maybe not having those any longer okay. but we're not at that point yet okay yeah. thank you nothing further and I would talk with commissioners about that first one yeah. question um, it's so you're getting less because the numbers are going down. Well, as our community is getting older, okay, like you and me, okay, and so on, is it that don't you expect that number to go up again? Especially for for Meals on Wheels, yes, that number will go up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Next is the health department. An organization. Good afternoon. Um, I have provided it's that time of year again where we'll be going through a three year accreditation review by the state of Michigan. Um, uh, about eight of our programs will be reviewed at that time. Um, what you're looking at is a large document that's called our plan of organization. And just to highlight some things that are included in it, it gives us our authority as the health department um, that that uh, outlines some of the various aspects of the public health code that talks about that authority as well as the authority given to us by our local governing entity. Um, it also provides for my, um, outlines my credentials as well as our medical directors um, so that we have um, viable leadership at the health department. Um, and it outlines, of course, our, our um, structural plan of organization as it stands. We'll be going through a review the week of October 21st, um, and then we need to submit this about two months before in August with your approval. Okay. 
Any questions, commissioners? So in summary, this mm -hmm. is just your plan of getting accreditation, okay? Maintain. Correct. Maintain Maintaining our accreditation that we go through every three years, and we have to submit the paperwork, which, of course, this year we have a changeover with the health officer and um, any structural changes we have going on at the health department, things like that. So, Like the hospital getting accredited every so many years by the... Uh, yep. And for the hospital, it's usually every five years, and for us, it's every three years. So. Question, Tony? Yes. Mm-hmm. There, I found the page pages. Um, page eighty-three out of one hundred and fifty-four here. <laughs> um, this is the uh, health department plan of organization. Page eighty-three, you're talking about financial things relative to the to the Department of Transportation. Was that in our the health department? Right. Um, probably because transportation is always seen as such a big need with our clientele. So we have to talk about in our strategic, what comes up in our strategic plan continuously is that that um, continues to be a need and how do we meet that need. Um, there's nothing in our budget per se for transportation um, except for we have the ability to bill Medicaid for our Medicaid clients to get reimbursed for transportation. Okay, so some mm -hmm. funds are listed in the road fund actually go to the health department no there isn't any money that goes from from the Are road provider service or what it's just it's just the um, referrals that we make for transportation and the fact that it comes up as a high need so there's no dollar figure dollars that go to the health department for that okay so the same thing on page 85 there's items relative to the sheriff's department and reimbursement ex of expenses and that's in your health department report or, or your plan of organization so look at that um, I would imagine because it's for the entire budget um, usually what we're submitting is a, an entire budget for the county budget and there might be pieces in there that you're seeing too for other departments and other areas because we don't have anything, again, that we get directly from the Sheriff's Department within our own budget. All right, we're going to be evaluating the annual county budget soon. So right. I'm just trying to get clear why our transportation or Sheriff's Department issues right. of the Health Department I plan of organization. I think it's to, to show that we're part of the county budget. Um, there's that health fund that... Latasha just talked about and that's part of of getting approval for the whole entire county budget so we have to provide a summary of all the departments and their um, summary of what they receive for like in terms of the county budget as well so that might be what you're looking at it's in the audit piece okay sorry I was looking at the all funds summary piece okay which then we're part of the county audit so So our piece of it isn't necessarily pulled out, but it's just the fact that we're part of the, the whole audit that goes through, that the county goes through. Well, Tony, what you're looking at there is the county audit. Her, her report, 154 pages, is made up of various documents across the county. That is last year's 2018, June, <laughs> June 2018 audit. And, uh, and it's showing their financial statements, including, and this here is the Sheriff Department cash disbursements uh, section 
and it doesn't really have any bearing on the health department at all. It's the, it's an exception in the sheriff's department because it says there you're looking at page what is that 85 <coughs> sheriff department cash disbursements, and it said uh, significant deficiency in internal controls over financial reporting. They're referring to like the commissary fund and the jail, where literally they well. For the audit, they don't have enough uh, controls on that, meaning you have a, a deputy and a, and a sergeant signing off on the expenditure to buy X, whatever it is, and it should be someone, it, the idea is it's someone outside of the Sheriff's Department also having a sign signatory on that. But it has nothing to do with the Health Department. That's the whole audit that's in there. Okay, so we didn't need 154 pages. That other stuff could have been edited oh. out. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Mike. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay. Next we go on to the thank you for a very long report. Mm -hmm. It's just usually updating stuff, so <laughs> it's not that bad. Need a thank you. Motion to go to the full board. So moved. Report. Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. Thank you very much for a very long, comprehensive <laughs> report. Okay. Can't take full credit. A lot of the work was done before I got here. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. Let's go to Jay, Health Department Annual Report. Sure. Which is strictly the Health Department. Right. <laughs> yep. Um, so what you have before you is our 2018 Annual Report. Um, and this one essentially just highlights and gives you a snapshot of some of the outcomes that we've achieved over the last year um, and where some of the program changes may have occurred, either through um, where we're increasing our hours to the public and our WIC clinic, um, to how we address different outbreaks, such as um, fortunately we didn't have any hepatitis A cases here, but how did that impact us in terms of what um, vaccine we got from the state? Um, talks about our teen outreach expansion funding that we received from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, talked about at that time, um, noting that we don't have the animal shelter this year, but that happened in 2018, so we were reporting on um, what actions and outcomes we took at that time. Um, talked a little bit about expansion of Medicaid reimbursement for hearing and vision, um, and where we're trying to um, generate some revenues to support the program and what we've done there. Uh, we also talked about our lead exposure prevention program for pregnant women specifically, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in my monthly report um, as far as what outcomes we've re reached to date. Uh, we do, of course, give some success stories and testimonials from clients that we've served um, to talk about the positive aspects of our programs. Um, and there was a insurance gap work group through our Access to Care Coalition, which is through the Health Improvement Organization, um, where we had done a project, um, again, this was before I came, and um, talking about the rate of uninsured um, individuals in our county and um, providing that in a pictorial map. And then you'll see some of our personal and preventative health services. These would include like our maternal infant health program early on, children's special health care services, um, our sexually transmitted disease program, HIV program, um, communicable disease immunizations, and all of those. I won't go through all of the numbers on those, but you can see all of that listed here. Then our health education, health promotion programs. Um, these are all the programs that provide positive programming for youth, um, as well as some of our tobacco reduction work in, in policies. Uh, teen pregnancy prevention, our car safety program, our lead poisoning prevention is done through here, um, as well as outreach to our Medicaid populations and various services. Then the finally, the, the final program would be, well, there's actually one more program, but environmental health, which talks about our restaurant inspections, uh, temporary food license, all of those, the permanent ones as well, our sewage and water permits, you can see all those numbers, soil erosion, um, campground, swimming pools, uh, septic permits. 
And then the final program was truly the um, emergency preparedness. We've done a number of drills over the course of last year and we'll continue to do them into this year um, where we've done uh, distribution of how we pass out medications if in the event that we need to do that for our county. Um, so, and then it talks about our financials um, and finally just our value statement and our, our uh, core statements that come from that. So this is again just a snapshot. We do have a more detailed report, a statistical report, but this is the one we distribute mainly to the public as well as other local health departments and the state and other um, public agencies that would want to know what out outcomes we've um, achieved over the course of a year. Any other questions, commissioners? <coughs> there is. Thank you. Um, the uh, teen abstinence and prevention programming, mm -hmm. uh, is this uh, the Get Real program? Yes. Okay. Yes. And Mary's, turn your microphone on. Oh. Is that better? Okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. So you said this, this is the Get Real program? This is the Get Real one that we've got. Like It's pretty going heavy right now in the summertime where we offer a number of um, programming, positive programming for youths. Okay. And how many youth are currently in the program? Do you know by chance? Um, I believe every session, like they have like 40 or 50 kids that are going through it, but um, they have sessions that are going on all throughout the summer, throughout this whole summer. I had the opportunity to um, help create the program when I was in college, so to see the mm -hmm. um, the program continuing today is still really, uh, it's really cool. Right. Um, and then also, let me see, with the number of, um, as, as it relates to the number of children um, receiving the uh, hearing screenings and vision mm -hmm. screenings, has that number decreased or increased from last year up to date? Well, it's probably, it stayed about the same. Um, what I'll report in my monthly report is that we're seeing a decline in providers that actually do take um, Medicaid um, as far as for optometry services. So um, while our screenings don't necessarily change, where we can refer kids to has, and that's impacted um, where we can send kids for, um, like if they come up as a positive screen or if they need more extended um, care beyond what we can provide. Um, you'll see ch you'll see some changes in there that we're working on. So, um, and then my last question: uh, Do they still do these types of screenings in the public school system? We do. Yes. Okay. During certain intervals and grades that the public health code gives us, um, tells us that we're dictated to provide, like okay. during those critical time periods of early education, um, as well as like later into the teen years, like when they're starting driver's ed, things like that. Okay. So. I'm sorry. I actually, I do have one more question that I. Um, that I did miss. Um, I'm a big promoter um, for youth programming, mm -hmm. uh, and so I was just wondering what the longevity of the uh, Get Real program would be, mm -hmm. if you had any idea, just in terms of funding and grants sure. and things of that nature. Um, so also in my annual report, I, I put down that we've applied for a teen pregnancy prevention grant through the state of Michigan, $100,000. We have been successful in previous years to get that money, um, so I'm hopeful that we will. Uh, we also do a number of programming for the younger grades, um, not just the high school and later adolescents, but early adolescents as well. Um, that's also a lot of that is provided through uh, state funding and grants that we get. Um, so I'm hopeful those will continue over time. Um, the other pieces in tobacco reduction that we do some of that education with youth, um, is particularly with new tobacco products. Um, so we are applying for a separate grant on that but a lot of times our target population is that, that youth population that we're trying to reach. So uh, some of it's direct grant funding and direct state funding that we've applied specifically for teens. Others of it, they touch through other grants that we get and pieces and parts of it that we're um, addressing that specific age population. I see, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, commissioners? Nothing further for me. Okay, thank you very much for a long, concise <laughs> report. Yeah. Next is Kay which is Health Department July Report. Sure. Um, so you'll see some activities here that uh, have passed, and I just wanted to give you more as an FYI. Um, the first is because we listed this under administration because it's definitely a, a work that we're doing in our personal health program as well as environmental health. It's an epi, um, epidemiology and a laboratory capacity grant. So speaking of grants with the state, we've applied for a $20,000 grant, and we're able to secure that. 
Um, so we've already been working on that where we've purchased, given that we have a shortened time frame, we have to um, utilize the money by July 31st. Um, however, it was helpful for us for purchasing a refrigerator and a freezer for immunization specifically. Um, so we were able to, uh, to upgrade our systems to be able to keep our vaccines safe. Uh, mosquito equipment we're doing, we're in the midst of mosquito surveillance right now, uh, where environmental health is going out to uh, catch mosquitoes and doing some things with Zika virus and West Nile virus and things of that nature. And so we were able to get some equipment for that, as well as um, lab and medical equipment for our sexual health clinic and our tuberculosis program. So um, mainly equipment, and we're in the process of spending that money now. The second piece is the hearing and vision program, which Commissioner Williams had mentioned. Um, we, we do fall under access to vision services. We fall below the 50% level for children in the 6 to 15 year old age group for Jackson County. And some of the barriers, as I had touched upon, include how Medicaid has a low reimbursement rate. Um, and there's no there's high levels of no-show rates for this clientele um, for scheduled appointments so that creates a significant barrier for optometric services to be offered here um, so one of the things that we're doing and have um, had meetings with our um, Center for Family Health to see where we can partner with them um, certainly they might have some resources and they're working through things with their board to see how um, they can help us with that effort the other pieces we're working with Representative Julie Alexander because um, as we recognize that um, it's not just in Jackson County, I mean it's a statewide issue, but um, there's certainly things that we know um, are occurring here that we have gaps in in terms of those providers that um, we're hoping that she can either help us increase reimbursement rates for Medicaid, um, which would certainly be an incentive for providers then to, to be taking on this service um, and you know hope to be successful there. Um, also strategize on possible solutions of, you know, Center for Ham Family Health is certainly one resource, but could there be other resources we can take advantage of? <coughs> Moving on to our WIC program. One um, question. Sure. Okay. In uh, regards to getting kids to do this, mm -hmm. I mean, every kid who plays sports in Jackson County has to Absolutely. have a sports physical sure. for them to play in a team. Right. If you add vision and hearing mm -hmm. things to that, you right. will get a lot of people getting that done right. because they want to play football, basketball, soccer, track, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Now, and, and that's very true. Um, there used to be a time back when the health departments used to do sports physicals and physicals for kids regularly. We don't do that as much because providers are doing that, or we would assume pro providers are doing that. Um, where we are more located is in the school um, s setting. Um, and so we wouldn't do the, you know, that's where we do the immediate screening. And then if something comes up, we're hoping to refer. And unfortunately, there's, there's times where we have no one to refer to. Um, because of that shortage. What but. I'm talking about it usually is a form. Mm -hmm. okay. Correct. The primary yep. care doctor has to fit, sure. check all the boxes. Yeah. And then you can have on the bottom of that hearing. Yeah. Thing, and the coach can't accept that to play right. until those two things are done. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we can work with providers more closely to assure that that part of the form is, is completed. But really, we rely on a lot of providers to do that and pediatricians to help to you know get those forms completed and things like that um, there are certain like there are obviously certain things in the public health code that legally it, you know as far as a child being in a certain grade we are required to screen them in those grades and I mean clearly they can move on but you know we'd hope to to identify those learning disabilities or anything like that visual impairments that might be going on early on before they progress to the next grade you know that's why we do it in the school setting thank you mm -hmm. okay I did, yep, I had a few more things to go over my, thanks. Um, for a WIC update, um, I had mentioned earlier that I think Richard had talked about how the state of Michigan issued a policy where the formula couldn't be donated to food pantries. Um, some good news on this is as of May 31st, we got a, uh, the, the state reconsidered that policy um, and we're now able to donate unused formula to the nonprofit entities. So we, we just have to have a policy and a log to track where those, um, those items that the vent like which vendors they go to and how much is goes there so we have a policy in place to pursue that 
Um, and then as I mentioned, you've seen on our annual report, WIC is going to be open from, um, and through August 30th, we're going to be open five days a week, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. That helps a lot of our clients um, to meet those needs where um, it's extended hours. Um, and then you can see a success story in there. I won't go through it in, in huge detail, but just the fact that we had a mom that came to a Kids Fest program here in our community, um, and her husband had, you know, was very proud and didn't want to receive any benefits or support from the health department. Um, however, she did return, and this was for her um, two-month-old baby. Um, she did return three days later and came to the health department, and um, her husband was on board, and she got the services she needed through WIC. So that was just a really good success story to share with you. Our car seat safety program, we've got about $5,000 in a grant that we received through Henry Ford Allegiance Health um, Community Vitality Committee. So that's a good partnership there. And as we talked about the tobacco program, um, just to submitted a report today, um, sorry, submitted a grant proposal today for $45,000. So that went through to the state. We're hoping to hear some positive news on that. And the pregnancy prevention, taking pride in pregnancy in, um, prevention program, uh, we submitted for a grant for $100,000 thousand dollars to the state of Michigan there um, talked about our get real program um, and that started on June 17th it's operating for about six weeks four days a week at the st. Paul's Episcopal Church downtown um, and I misspoke there's actually 70 youth registered right now in that 10 to 15 age group so um, it's actually a little larger number so <laughs> Talking about our lead screening program, this is the one for pregnant women specifically. Uh, to date, the health department has received a total of 49 referrals for lead screening of pregnant women specifically, and the health department was able to reach 24 of those referred women, um, and they all screened positive for a lead risk. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're all positive for lead, but it could be that they're in a um, situation, whether it's housing um, or anything else, where they might be at risk for um, having lead in their system. So then they were referred on further for blood testing um, and six declined and only three have completed the testing at this point. So the grant period comes to an end on that grant, um, end of August. We don't know if we'll continue it. However, we hope to continue the nutrition education, which is a critical piece of it, through our WIC program. So we're going we're gonna to continue some of the services through there. Um, but again, as you can see from the numbers, we're not anticipating, um, we haven't anticipated a high number with that. Um, so to pursue that program without a grant, um, which we may not, likely not do um, for pregnant women specifically. And then talking about our communicable disease program, um, hepatitis A, as I talked about before, uh, one of the most preventive, effective ways is hand washing to prevent that. And we were fortunate not to have hepatitis A cases here um, during the large statewide outbreak that took place. Um, so we have been able to help with the fair to establish hand washing stations, things like that. So we'll continue to do that. Um, the other big thing going on with communicable disease right now is a tuberculosis outbreak. Um, we do have a couple individuals, one that is, continues to be hospitalized um, and another that we've secured in housing at this point. Um, we have about, our, my report should be updated to say about 90 some contacts that are associated with these individuals. Um, contacts could mean people who've um, been in close proximity to these individuals. They don't necessarily mean that all of these are going to come up positive. So we're very hopeful that they had limited um, closeness and mobility with these individuals and that not all of these cases come up positive. We've had six cases that we've referred to three other counties. Um, so it's been, um, that's been good to be able to take that off our plates and focus on the ones that are in our county. Um, and then we've done a number of skin tests for um, individuals that have been in contact with them. So it's taken a tremendous amount of time, but we're getting to the point where we're honing in on um, what cases we need to be dealing with and which ones require more of our time. Um, for these two individuals, we'll be continuing to do medication called direct observed therapy, where our nurse will go to the home and administer medications for a period of six to nine months. Um, so that's, it's going to be a long-term thing where we'll continue to, to um, address this issue. Um, and then our sexual disease program, we've done a presentation with Henry Ford Women's Health, um, and we'll continue to 
Um, we provided Im information on the HIV 2019 felony law, um, on expedited partner therapy, and um, this is one area I'm hoping we can boost in terms of outreach services for the hospital. A lot of times the hospital recognizes they treat them in the ER and then they just leave, so they treat them in street -em attitude. Um, and we're hoping to do some follow-up care to that and doing some outreach where we can do some education um, and open that up for the hospital. Couple things finally with environmental health, the Fisher Park, um, Fisher Trailer Park update in Napoleon Township. Um, we did do the um, condemnation there, as well as the shutoffs, or we, we worked with the uh, um, community agencies to do shutoff of the utilities. Um, we helped individuals secure housing, um, get them to appropriate housing, and um, we're now at the point where um, letters have been sent to the owner, and we're waiting for them to respond. Um, they've paid taxes up to 2017, so um, as far as you know, where that continues and where that goes would likely be on whether they're delinquent on their taxes and how that plays out. And then the second piece is just our private and type three water, public supply water program that was reviewed by DEQ, um, excuse me, now their Department of Environmental Great Lakes and Energy, um, and we had completed a self-assessment, and we'll go through that cycle. Uh, third and final piece is on the methamphetamine contamination. Um, we did have one resident in Henrietta Township that um, has methamphetamine contamination. We worked to um, get sampling done and um, that site has been condemned and now we're working through the, the legal process of um, assuring that uh, the samples are, are done by us independently and um, providing the results in court on that. That was my full report. I can answer any questions. I just one final question on the Get Real program. Has there been a decrease um, in teen pregnancies in Jackson County since um, the program has started? For the, if there's been a decrease in teen pregnancies? Um, unfortunately, I think we continue to see like either the level is, is increasing a little or it's at the same. Um, the programming is, con that we, we know now that the program continues to be needed. Um, I don't have a specific rate for you. I'd have to look that up for Jackson County. Um, that's kind of what I've heard anecdotally through our staff is why we continue to apply for these grants and continue that programming. But I can get that number for you and get back with you on that. Nothing further for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, Commissioners. Um, uh, before you, you should have actually, um, I think, uh, three um, um, papers. Um, one is the medical examiner's um, report for 2018. The other one is a synopsis of the contract um, terms and conditions, and then a summary. Um, the pathology contract is that since um, um, we're no longer doing autopsies at Henry Ford, um, Allegiance Health. Um, sometimes the pathologist has to take tissues um, and we need to make slides, you know, from those. So we have to have a contract. We had a former contract with the hospital, but since things have changed, um, we had to update the contract, and the contract is the financial impact will be $75 per case that we refer to them. Now, that doesn't mean that every case that we do an autopsy on that we refer um, to them, um, but we have to have this performed so that uh, we can do histology and other pathological studies um, on, the, on the tissues. Um, and then secondly, um, since we no longer um, have a um, morgue at the hospital, we have a temporary storage um, for people who die. Uh, when the patients uh, die in the middle of the afternoon, uh, before we used to just send them to the morgue and then go down there and do the uh, autopsy. However, now we um, transport them to the uh, um, storage area. Um, what they're going to call the morgue, and then in the morning they get transported to our facility, um, you know, uh, you know, out of the hospital. So part of this uh, agreement also, um, and the fee um, is to pay for the, that body transport to our morgue um, uh, on Shanter Road. Any questions? Seventy-five dollars per case. 
Yeah, it includes all of it. Yes, uh, how are you today? Hi. Um, it says page 8 of, eight of 10, and we're missing 9 and 10. I'm just wondering what those documents are, if they're irrelevant, or if they've just accidentally been left out. Jill will double check to see if there's anything else. Just email it if. Yeah. Okay. Jill's going to check to see if there's any um, extra pages there, and if there are, we'll submit it because that was a synopsis. Yeah, it's actually the annual report for 2018. Um, and before you, if you want to refer to the various manners, I'm going to talk to. I'm going to put because what you see before you is actually raw numbers. <clears throat> I'm going to put it in perspective um, for you. So that in 2018, there were 1,767 deaths, you know, in the county. 411 were actually officially referred to the Office of Medical Ex Examiner to review. Actually, that number is actually higher because now every death that occurs in the hospital gets called to me at any time and all times of uh, uh, the day to tell them whether or not it needs to be investigated or can be released. Um, of those, um, we've performed 189 autopsies, uh, which is actually 46 percent of those that are referred to us. And of the total number of deaths in the county, it's 10.7 percent of the total number of deaths. Under manner of death, Okay, natural, um, the greatest number was 255, which comes out to be 14.4% uh, of the total deaths referred to us. Accidental was 47, which is 2.7%. And it's actually the percentages that put it in, pers in perspective here. Suicides were 35, and that's 2% of the total deaths um, in the county. Homicide was 13, which is 0.7%. The percentages aren't on your report. Um, those were what I figured out and just reporting to you now. Uh, undeterminable was 61 and that's 3.5% um, of the deaths. Under homicide or under accidental, the greatest number um, of deaths were 20, which ends up being 42.6% of the accidental deaths. Falls were 21 um, out of 47, which was 44.7 percent, and um, asphyxia, which is anything from overlaying, hangings, um, uh, stra accidental strangulations, anything like that, was 6.4 percent. The majority of these deaths occurred between the ages of 80 and 89. The second group, the largest group where these occurred, was 60 to age 60 to 69, and then the third group was between 70 and 79 percent. Um, the male-female relationship uh, ratio was about the same, 23 to 24 percent, or 23 to 24. Um, suicides. Uh, were interesting is that there were 35 in the county. Um, 27 of them were gunshot wounds, or 77.1 percent. Um, hangings were 14.3 percent, and um, vehicular suicide was 2.9 percent. The greatest age, the age group um, ranges um, from 30 to 79, with a peak being between the ages of 30 and 49. 30 of them were uh, males, and five of them were women. Um, homicides, gunshot wounds were 11 um, of 13, 
for 84.6%. Stabbings were one of 13 for 7.7% .7 of those were um, evaluated. And assaults or beatings were 7.7%. Um, the male to female relationship there was 12 to 1. And the most common age groups were 10 to 19 and 30 to 39. Um, undeterminable um, where um, drug and alcohol, there were um, 61, 56 of them were uh, related to drug and alcohol, which accounted for 92% of those referred to us. Um, the male to female ratio was 45 to 16, uh, and the age range was from 30 to 59, um, with 82% occurring in that age group um, from, um, and those are uh, most often are drug overdoses. Um, the uh, drug-related deaths, if you go look at that in the next, um, in 2016 there were 3% of the total population, 2017 it was 4.3% of the total population or of the total number of deaths um, for the county. Um, in 2018 it was 34 um, for this. Um, and then you can see there the drugs that um, we were monitoring, um, um, which is cocaine, fentanyl, and heroin. Now when you look at those drugs, those were the drugs that everyone is following, but there are other drugs of um, abuse, you know, synthetics, homemade, and methamphetamine, um, benzodiazepines, you know, there's a number of other drugs. Uh, and, you know, most people think that people die from just one drug, but most of the patients that uh, we were investigating have multiple drugs on board. And then the problem is, is you can't account, um, you have to account for the interaction and the multiple um, actions of these, um, of, you know, of these drugs. Um, and um, of those that uh, with the drug-related deaths, 27% um, um, uh, um, were female. Um, and 73% were male. Vicodin would, uh, uh, actually Vicodin gets metabolized to a, uh, to a morphine metabolite, so it would test under heroin. Okay, heroin gets metabolized to morphine. The real big one that I think is to look at is um, fentanyl. Um, with that, fentanyl is, um, uh, there, the only thing that I can see that it gets um, prescribed from a doctor's office is um, duragesic, you know, or duragesic patches, okay? That's not what it's called. That, that fentanyl, most of the time, is a synthetic fentanyl that's coming. Those are street drugs. Those are being delivered, you know, um, and mixed with. And you can see that when we looked at that, that has, uh, you know, primarily replaced heroin. But there's a big number of patients, too, that are dying for, with, for, you know, from cocaine. Pardon me? Um, it gets all metabolized, you know, the, the metabolites that were, are measured in the lab, um, all of the fentanyls have um, the me metabolite that we, um, that the lab measures for it. So that's what it'll... You know, the carfentanil, which is the elephant uh, tranquilizer, you know, would be in there also. And it just takes minimal um, medication um, to cause death. No, no, that. Yeah, I just pulled it up, re-updated my, my system in front of me here. And uh, 10 of 10 are there. And they have uh, miscellaneous regulatory reference and interpretations, assignment, delegation, applicable law and forum. Yeah. Thank you, John. Nice okay. to see you again. Nice to see you, Al. Thank you, everyone. The, hold a second, didn't, um, we need to send this to the full board, this agreement. The pathology services agreement. Yeah, he is, he is.
He's going. You got to entertain a motion on that, right? Okay, now. I have to entertain a motion.